Welcome. Did the coronavirus just crush all hopes of a fairer world, or is this the perfect chance for a great reset? This is the Global World Economic Forum's Jobs Reset Summit. So far, we've had three days of visionary leaders debating from the worlds of business, government, civil society, and the media, reshaping growth, jobs, and skills were the main topics of the last few days. Today, equity, inclusion, and social justice. Our guests are McKinsey's Kevin Sneeder, Ashley Shelby Rosette from the Fuqua School of Business, and Laura Thompson from the International Organization for Migration, as well as Fumzila Mlambo Nunguka from UN Women. She'll be joining the conversation a little later in the show. I'm Ben Fazulan, for those who can't spell that, F-A-J-Z-U-L-L-I-N. It's a tricky one. I've been spelling it all my life. It's not an easy one. I get checked at almost every second airport for explosives. Um, but it's nothing to match the anxiety of growing up as a gay man. That was very difficult in the Australian media landscape. It changed very much when I came to Germany, and it's changing every day. But for a lot of minorities, the world hasn't changed enough, especially in the workforce. And a second lockdown is now here. Corona is putting a lot of uh, a lot of the development and uh, progression uh, back into reverse. It's something I'd like to ask Kevin Sneeder about. Is it within this contracting economy harder or easier to embed social justice? Well, I think the reality is if we think there's a reset and we need to hit a reset button, maybe we should also be hitting the panic button because we've reached this moment in time where so many forces have come together that a more fundamental question has to be asked, which is, are we now at a point where if we don't do something, the society cohesion that we think is so important to progress is going to be lost? And I think the answer to that question is yes, we've reached that moment. There are so many numbers, Ben, that point to that reality, whether it's in gender, social justice, and many other aspects of equality. Let me just give you a few and, and, and put them in the context of the pandemic, because arguably there actually had been real progress. You talk about uh, what you had seen personally in Germany and other parts of the world. And I think we could point to some numbers. In gender, we could certainly point to progress. And in race, we could point to slow but meaningful progress, income inequality gaps beginning to close. However, the pandemic really has been a moment of reset. And the answer why? Because it has disproportionately impacted those who are the most vulnerable to it. And they often are the minority groups. In fact, it's intersections, the places where different types of minority experience come together. We see that most profoundly. Let me just offer a few numbers. Black women are three times more likely than white women to report the death of a loved one as a top priority in this crisis. That's another aspect of the fact that we know the mortality rate has been higher in the black population. Black women are twice as likely than other women to say they do not have strong allies in the workplace to help them in this moment. And one in three have considered leaving the workforce completely in this moment on the back of the pandemic. Those numbers are in the United States. Frankly, it gets even worse in other countries. And that's why I think we talk about reset, but I think we need to add to reset a real sense of urgency, an emergency, a panic moment, a moment when the progress that has been made could go backwards. I could go on, but I know in the interest of time, let me just answer your question with, it doesn't have to be a negative moment though. There is still time to respond. There is a moment when we could realize that actually flexibility, the opportunity to rethink the progression in careers, the chance to use this moment when there's a lot of stimulus and support being injected into economies to target it in a way which addresses some of these injustices and inequalities, that's there too. And I haven't even begun to tackle the topic of the type of injustice that we saw come to fore on the back of the killing of George Floyd and other incidents around the world. But let me stop there. I know there's a lot to cover in this session. Well, Ashley, let's stay in the US and uh, pick up on those numbers. What, what sort of gaps are there? there? There's a lot missing as far as minorities and ethnicities go. And when it comes to policy making, uh, I mean, a bunch of white guys write the code when it comes to tech. And tech could have been so unbiased 
but uh, it doesn't look like that's the way it's going. What are some of the gaps in data and findings? Yeah, I think um, building very much on what Ben has, um, sorry, what Kevin has um, described Ben, is that um, when we look at the gaps, um, what we have to fundamentally look at is the data. So when we look at the data, we think about the way in which we have to disaggregate the data, the way in which we have to, have to interpret that data and the making that data availability in order to see some change and the reset that we would like to see. So one of the stats that's oftentimes quoted in the United States, probably the most popular one, is the notion of the unemployment rate, the jobs rate. People anticipate this rate um, every month. So back in February, that rate was around 3%. In April, it was around 16%. Recently, it's been around 8%. But if we start to disaggregate that number, we look and see what's that unemployment rate for Blacks versus Whites. For Blacks, it's around 13%. For Whites, it's around 6%. If we disaggregate it even more and add an intersectional lens that is encompassing both race, gender, and age, we see that young Black women, again, building off the stat that Kevin mentioned, young Black women have an unemployment rate in the United States of 25%. That fundamentally says that when a Black woman is looking for a job, she's experiencing something very different than is a white man. And if we attempt to try to dismantle and, un, and address this inequality with a, a, a sweeping brush that's the same for all, it's not likely going to result in the change that we would like to see. So number one, we have to consider the aspect of disaggregating this data and looking at it uh, at a more granular level in order to try to address some of the change. Number two, we wanna consider that, um, how, how exactly are we interpreting um, 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 this data? Again, recognizing those fundamental distinctions, right? And, 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 and acknowledging that these experiences are embedded in larger systems and larger structures that we have to address. So if we talk about the research, we know that, for example, um, whites are likely, more likely to be called back for a job when they, even when they have a criminal record, more so than our blacks. We know that resumes with white sounding names are more likely to be uh, called in for interviews than our blacks. We know that blacks are actually encouraged to whiten their resumes in order to get jobs. Once in the organizations, we know that um, if you choose to advocate for the diversity, that there can be serious repercussions in terms of perceptions of competence with regards to blacks and women's, but women, but very little with regards to white and men. And we also know that fundamentally, and this is speaking from my own research, that there exists this aspect of a white standard of leadership. And what does that do to the aspect of not just getting into the organization, but matriculating up the organization? And the third aspect I'd probably say when we talk about data and gaps of research is the availability of the data. That is, we don't know what's happening inside the organizations because the organizations don't make that data available. We have seen, you mentioned tech, right? We have seen some advances over the last few years in terms of transparency with these various diversity reports and tech, um, but that's been a very, very small uh, um, example. We saw recently PricewaterhouseCoopers also chose to have a diversity report. But if we're going to understand what's happening in these organizations and try to adjust, uh, to try to influence this inequity, we have to know one, what are the numbers? And two, what are the organizations doing? And whether or not what they're doing is actually working. Um, like Kevin, I could talk on and on and on, but I think I'll just kind of leave it there for now and see what questions are posed. I, I like the fact that we're, we're talking uh, data, but what, what about tech? And what about people with disabilities? They've often been pioneer users in that sector. Do, do they hold the the key to uh, to some of these answers here. Ashley, maybe you can answer that. I'm sorry, what, in terms of disability and... For people with disabilities, they've often been pioneer users in, in tech um, and uh, using programs that a lot of other people would never have needed to use or come across. Um, could they hold the key in some, in, in some ways to finding solutions uh, to see that we see equity put at the center of policymaking? Yeah, I think we know that whenever we attempt to try to resolve um, disparity and considering uh, marginalized communities, it causes us a certain level of innovation. 
It causes us to think in ways that we have not necessarily ne not necessarily previously needed to think of, and so uh, pre previously needed to think. And I think that can be a source of, of trying to incorporate and be more inclusive in the in our processes that we have in our organizations to help minimize these inequities. So, um, but as you mentioned, then we have to have a willingness, right, to start to address these marginalized communities. I think we have a willingness to address, you know, things like disability uh, because people um, fundamentally agree on that. When it comes to things like race and gender, those are a little bit more difficult. So I think it can be an inroad, right, but it's not an, an ending, if you will, because of the way in which we, the distinction in terms of how we, we look at uh, disability versus race versus gender um, versus religion versus um, you know all the other disparities that we have. So a, a beginning, but definitely not an ending. I'd like to bring in Laura Thompson now from the International Organization for Migration. Laura, what signs of change are there that this moment of flux that we're talking about could actually be used to proactively embed a greater equity in, in the new economy when it comes to migration, which is uh, the field you work in? Sure. I think we have to look uh, uh, a little bit to what the pandemic has brought to migrants. And uh, I would say there are two, two sides of it as, as everything in life. One part is uh, the negative side. And, and obviously there is a loss of jobs that has been extremely important for migrants, particularly those that were uh, undocumented. Reduction in remittances is another big part with some of the places even going to half of the remittances that were, they were sending in, in the past, like in Central America. Thousands of people that were stranded uh, in the middle uh, between transient countries or some, some of them in, in the destination countries uh, that uh, were not able to return and didn't have enough funds to cover their stay. And other type of, uh, of things like anti-migrant sentiment, xenophobia, and this type uh, of, of reactions. On the other side, there have been a lot of very positive uh, aspects as well, because very quickly, governments realized that migrants were part of the solution to this pandemic. And this applied in two main sectors. First of all, in the health sector, where they saw that there is a huge amount of doctors and nurses uh, that, uh, that, are from, that, uh, that are foreigners and that are serving uh, in, 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 the, in the countries of, uh, in developed countries particularly, and that were very present in the response to, to, to the pandemic. But the other side was the agriculture and distribution and supply chain uh, sectors where, again, migrants were predominant. So there were a number of, I would say, innovative measures that were taken by a number of governments that are quite positive and I think open a good opportunity. Now I see two or three opportunities that are going to be very important for the future. The first one is global health uh, for everybody. Uh, this has shown, this crisis has shown that uh, providing access to health to migrants, including the undocumented migrants, is, is not uh, a generosity, but it's a total need if everybody wants to be safe. So uh, that uh, is extremely important. The second, the second element that I, that I see as a very important element is that this crisis could have been the beginning of a change in the discourse about um, migrants and, and the negative perception about it because it has shown the positive uh, contribution that they make, but also with regard to skills. Uh, very often we talk about high skilled people are welcome, but the low skilled people are not welcome. And this crisis has shown that the low skilled people are important too. And the third element that I will bring uh, that I think is going to be quite uh, innovative in the future is uh, the possibility of thinking about the, uh, the, the labor market and how uh, this virtual reality that we have created the capacity to work remotely is going to have an impact in the labor and whether we are going to begin talking seriously uh, about uh, virtual uh, labor migration and how governments will need to adapt uh, in order to allow that in a much easier way. Joining the conversation now is Fumzila Mlambo Nguka from UN Women. Fumzila, um, Tell me, just how badly has this pandemic exacerbated inequalities? Uh, can you hear me? I can. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, women are 
disproportionately affected uh, by this pandemic. And there are really three ways that we have identified as particularly concerning. Uh, noting that uh, there is no crisis that is gender neutral. We've learned from previous crises, uh, the Ziga, uh, the Ebola crisis also showed us the gender dimension of these crises. Uh, in Ebola, for instance, the restriction of the mobility of women severely affected their livelihoods. And in this pandemic, we have seen that we saw that men were able to recover after the pandemic and go to pre-pandemic level of economic activity. But for many women, they lost everything without insurance and capacity to recover. And of course, women are also in insecure employment, mostly informal, and that does not give them some of the cushioning that you, you are able to have when you have a formal employment. Uh, women are also uh, overrepresented in the hard hit sectors of the economy, such as tourism, uh, hospitality, and the service sector. And thirdly, the crisis of unpaid care. Women's unpaid care in families and communities has been too long taken for granted. But in this crisis, it reached a new high. And one of the biggest takeaways from this crisis that we should all work for is that we should have proper policies to reduce unpaid care on women, to remunerate it, and to redistribute it. Whether it is through parental care, it is, it is still accessible and affordable child care, we need to make sure that we do not have this sustained cushioning of the economies through free labor of women that is not recognized. So women are taking much harder to recover because if there isn't a second way of dealing with unpaid care, they are unable to be ready for the labor markets again. We are hoping that both private and public sector will be seized with finding a way out for the women so that we can build back better for women as well. Thank you. Well, what, what is the way out, Fumzila? What's your advice to women who've uh, pulled themselves out of, out of work, out of jobs, to, to care for kids, uh, to look after households? How can they get back into work if that's what they want to do? Uh, well, it's not about women having to do this just by themselves. This has to be a, a, a partnership with the other stakeholders who have the adequate authority and resources to, to intervene. And one of the ways is indeed addressing the social, through social protection, so that we, are, we allow for women to be in transit to a better uh, and, 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 and a more livable life. But also the fiscal stimulus that many governments have announced needs to target women much better and to make sure that going forward, uh, women do not go back to the pre-pandemic levels of informality that makes them un, un, non-beneficiaries of interventions by government. From what we know at this point is that less than 18% of what is available in the massive fisc fiscal stimulus that are there is targeted and is likely to reach women. And yet women are amongst the majority of those who will be unemployed. The ILO estimates that about 500 million women will be out, out, out of jobs and many of them, not unless there is intervention, they will never be able to go back to a normal working life. Let me bring up then this need for an equi-covery, a quote from Anna Marie Kause, uh, who was uh, involved in these panels just yesterday. Um, the old normal didn't work for many of us. How do we then, Kevin, how do we put equity at the center uh, of things? Well, here's the, the opportunity. I mean, we've, we've obviously painted a picture that amplifies the urgency of the matter. But there is a potential for a more diverse and equitable workforce, and technology does have a fairly fundamental role to play. So I recognize 
this does not apply globally because access to technology indeed is one of the issues. But let's hold on that for a, for, for a moment. One of the realities of the old normal was there was a lack of geogra geographic flexibility. The labor pool that you sought to recruit from was the one in the immediate area. And quite often that brought issues of race and other matters into a place where it was impossible to make progress. Now there is the possibility to be much more flexible but from where one recruits. And that geographic flexibility can be a counter to some of the issues that get in the way of a more diverse workforce. Secondly, there is the potential for greater flexibility in order to help on work life and other balance. Now, I recognize that flexibility isn't always working. At the moment, there's a fine line between remote working and sleeping at the office, and many people are sleeping at the office, and that is disproportionately impacting women and getting in the way of progress. But let's recall one of the biggest obstacles to progress for women and indeed people at the intersection was the reality that there was a lack of flexibility in their lives. There is that potential now. The third is a more, perhaps a softer thought, which is I think we're all rapidly realizing we've got the physical virus dreadful as it has been in the damage it has wrought, but there's also the mental health challenge. And with it, many employers, I think, are beginning to understand that one has to think holistically about health and the importance of health. And I think that also can allow for a better attitude and approach to some of the issues we've been discussing. So my hope is that a combination of flexibility, geographic mobility, a greater appreciation for the full issues associated with equality can indeed come together to make this a moment where the reset does allow progress to be made. And it does indeed depart from the old ways of working that clearly have got us to a place that is not sustainable when it comes to racial justice and equity and other forms of equity. Ashley, we've got some viewer questions coming in and I want to pose this one to you about privacy of data. In some countries, it's even illegal to understand questions about diversity background. What can companies do to collect the right data? Yeah, so I think um, that notion of variability across the world and what is or is not acceptable to be reported, I think is really uh, something that we have to consider. Whereas we know in the United States you can, but you choose not to. We know in other countries that um, you know that actually uh, by law you can't you can't do that. Um, I think you still have to hold yourself accountability uh, accountable for what's happening in your organization, even if you're not able to share that information out. And so um, the idea that we would like to see change, but we are not benchmarking from where we are, want to move, it's fundamentally a problem. You can't ex expect a progress if you don't know from where you are progressing. And so to say that you actually want equity and you actually want change, you have to have those metrics. And so by whatever means your country allows you to do so, you have to have a starting point. It's similar to revenue, right? If you decided that any company decided that they wanted to increase their revenue by twofold and wanted to do that within a certain period of time, um, they would set that metric out there um, in some shape, form, or fashion, um, whether you have to couch it in those things that perhaps may be uh, confounded with it. So if you're not able to uh, report race, are you able to report socioeconomic status, those things that tend to, uh, to, to correlate uh, with race very strongly. But to say that you know we can't do it because we're not allowed to do it, so therefore we will not address it, um, and then also want change at the same time, those things simply don't work um, hand in hand. So by whatever means you can be accountable that, uh, that your country allows you to do so, then that's what you should seek to do. The other thing that I think that you have to really understand if we're talking about metrics is that um, it's also about culture. Um, the culture of the, the country, the culture of the organization. We say we want change, but change does not feel good to us. Change is not innate in the way in which we would like to operate. We would instead like to operate in, homo in homogeneous um, environments. Why? Because similarity attraction paradigm tells us that that's what feels good. Um, when we want change, um, that's going to cause us to perhaps give up something or for us to interpret that we have to give up something as opposed to trying to recognize that there can be enough for all and it does not have to be a zero sum game. So altering our culture, when we go into these organizations and we go into countries, you'll be hard pressed to find, um, well, mostly 
hard pressed to find people who do not espouse equality and equity and aspirations um, for, um, for you know, these overall diversity, equity and inclusion in initiatives. Um, everyone says yes to the idea. What they say no to is the policies and the procedures and the practices and the internal lens that has to take place in order for that change to, to happen. Um, what we know is that when we have the proper motivation, we can accomplish almost anything. So the question is, when you say that um, this notion of, you know, we don't, we're not allowed to have these metrics, we're not allowed to do these things, um, but when you have proper motivation, we can accomplish almost anything. So um, to say these things sometimes can just be um, an excuse if you will. And I would challenge you to get above the excuses to, in order to move these metrics forward and to have a true jobs reset as we are describing it um, here. But again, you have to know from where you're moving. Otherwise, you don't know where the progress is actually taking place. Laura, what do we have to do? What do governments have to do and companies as well to prevent things going back into reverse? You, you were telling us about how fantastic migrants uh, are now considered uh, as far as global health goes. What happens when the pandemic's over? Well, uh, again, I think uh, it, is, it, is, it has become clear to people that uh, uh, this is, this is, uh, the, the access uh, to health is not uh, a generosity act, act but, but really a necessity. Uh, and uh, um, I, I, I am not seeing everything positive because uh, we have also seen a lot of uh, xenophobia and reaction against migrants, saying that migrants are the ones bringing the virus into the countries. So th there is always the two sides of the same story, but I am talking about the opportunities that it can bring. And I think governments have realized now, for example, in the health uh, part, uh, that migrants, including those that are undocumented, have to be included uh, in the response, uh, in, in the mechanisms that have been created for response. Uh, for, from the health perspective, everybody has taken it in a certain manner, in a, in a more easier way. Now, from a socioeconomical perspective, the majority of uh, uh, that have been provided uh, and, you know, um, trying to facilitate uh, access to, to, to jobs, maintain the maintenance of jobs and things like this, have totally ignored migrants, particularly those that are uh, in irregular conditions because they are blind to the system. Uh, and they have to understand that very often uh, governments have understood now that they need to address those things. We have seen here, for example, in Geneva, uh, in Switzerland, queues of people uh, looking for uh, items to eat, something that was shocking the whole society in, in Switzerland because nobody thought that there would be that amount of people within the, the lockdown that will not be able uh, to get basic food uh, needs. Uh, nonetheless, that has come out. And I think that has created also a reaction of government saying, okay, these are the blind spots that we have. And these are things that we need to address seriously if we don't want to get into this situation again. And as we said, we are closing, getting close to the second lockdown, maybe in Europe, and, and these eventually could be solutions uh, that are already developed or included into the second response. So you're, you're also talking about once this pandemic is over, what, what if it's not over for a long time from now? Kevin, uh, what's your longer outlook as far as equity goes? Because this uh, could drag on for, for quite some time. W what if we're stuck with this uh, crisis for another year, say, or another two years? Well, I think um, there's every likelihood we're stuck with it for quite some time. I mean, I think we can all speculate as to exactly what length and much of it hinges, of course, on the progress of the vaccines. But there are a few things which I think it's worth remembering as we think about the long term. And I'll come at it from the point of view of business, which is a reminder that there is a business case for racial justice and equity that is powerful in the extreme, and it's in the data. If you look at the performance of the top quartile, then they are 36% more likely to have more diverse teams. There is just this, I don't think I could argue it's causation, but I can argue correlation between high-performing organizations 
tend to have more racially diverse, more gender diverse teams. And there's lots of good reason why that is. So I think, Ben, part of the answer is this is a compelling point of progress from an economic point of view, from a business point of view, and from a societal point of view. If we are going to be in a reality where this is also a pandemic that has long lasting effects, it is vital we act with that reality in mind that I just described. And it's why I believe that if it's longer term, the stimulus and the other measures that come to be deployed, they should reflect the economic sense and the social sense, and they should ensure that we target resources, economic support, other activity to make progress. Because if we don't, the long-term consequences of continuing to allow what is happening now to evolve without intervention really would be extraordinarily damaging. And we could speculate as to how they would manifest. But Kevin, I've read those same numbers in many reports from the World Economic Forum over many years. Uh, For Mzila, why is it still so hard for a black woman to make a career? Oh, well, uh, I think uh, the discrimination, uh, racial discrimination, uh, uh, that is is well and and alive. Uh, Opportunities are much more accessible for people of different racial groups. And uh, there isn't enough recourse uh, for discrimination. It is not easy for someone to go and say, I am not, I didn't get this job because I'm discriminated because people tell you, you are playing the racial card. So it is still a very, very hard path. We've had policies on uh, affirmative action and, and, and on uh, racial equality, but actually you cannot change people's behavior, attitudes that easily. It is still hard. There's just still some stubborn attitude that we have not been able uh, uh, to change and to convert uh, into equity that empowers women who don't even need black women, who don't even need affirmative action, who just need their skills to be respected and recognized because they are not asking for a favor. They have what is required in the job. Well, what's going to change that if the numbers don't? Because they are very convincing uh, and and. Kevin uh, keeps uh, mentioning them, but I, I don't see that change. What, what, what's going to really change things? You know, in, 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 in companies and in countries, if we're talking about representation, at, at, for instance, in parliaments and so on, where you provide enforceable measures that require certain percentage and diversity to be realized, that is when we have seen movement. It is just not possible to rely on the goodness on people's heart. Those who are shareholders and uh, those who are decision makers in these companies, shareholders need to demand the changes and those who are uh, running the companies need to be held accountable for diversity that is real and, 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 and seen in the workplace. We are seeing that, though. I mean, we are seeing shareholders demand uh, companies to be more responsible, more equitous. Um, we're, we're seeing a completely different generation grow up with completely different demands and respect for one another. Ashley, is, is it changing enough, though? Not certainly not enough and not quick enough. And uh, to the extent that, as you say, younger people may be um, are more open and uh, committed to diversity, uh, the generation of those who are still in charge is not as committed. Mm-hmm. And therefore, there has to be a way in which uh, the expectations for diversity can be enforceable. Otherwise, even where you have policies, if they don't have teeth and enforceability, they don't mean anything. Ashley, what's it like in the corporate world? Yeah, I think um, there are a couple of things happening here that I hope we're able to capitalize on that the pandemic has shed light on because what we had happen at the, during the pandemic are two central things. We had the social crisis, the, un, the racial unrest. We also had the economic crisis and we had the health crisis. And so what it allowed us to do is to not look at one or the other, right? But to actually look at two things simultaneously looking at you know, the economic inequality um, and also within the context of 
of the social injustice and say that it's not one or the other, but we have to do both. I think as a result, we have an opportunity to capitalize on something that um, hasn't happened in my lifetime. Not to say that it hasn't happened, but hasn't happened in my lifetime. And that is we actually have corporations starting to want to um, engage in an integrative uh, solution as opposed yeah. to a one-off solution. Um, what we saw pre-pandemic was the notion that uh, there is underrepresentation. So what we need to do is that we need to hire more. But that was it. Um, there was not a lot of focus on retention or altering behavior or community pre presence or communication. And so um, this idea, this notion of a more integrated approach and trying to attack the issue from multiple domains, I think is ultimately what's going to see result in the change that we have that we would like to see. Um, as Swing really has, uh, has, has, has highlighted, the notion of actually focusing on changing attitudes, that's a very, very, very slow process. Um, and mm -hmm. it's gonna take a whole lot of time. And I don't know that that's gonna happen. Uh, we've been trying to change attitudes for a long period of time. We have to actually change the structure of the entity, focusing not just on behavior in terms of in terms of compliance, but also internalization of these ideas. Kevin talked about the business case for diversity, but that needs to be in conjunction with the moral case of diversity. And so I think with the pandemic and seeing both the economic difference yes, and uh, the social justice differences and uh, trying to address uh, both uh, of them at the same time is that same. perhaps we actually can address uh, both at the same time. Because what history tells us is that when an economic crisis comes, that oftentimes the focus on diversity is the first thing that falls off. And so, you know, you choose not to put your, your energies and your monies there, but what this pandemic has forced us to do with the statements that all the corporations have been made that we're currently um, analyzing, uh, with the commitments that the leaders um, have made, and then with the empowerment that the employees and the workers have demonstrated in their commitment to this, is to say that this needs to be a much more integrative approach and not just trying to tackle it um, um, you know, by, by focusing just on, on, on the numbers. And I think then what we're also seeing is that um, putting real money behind and resources behind this change. Now, is it at the level that it should be? No, but is that a level that we haven't really seen uh, condensed within such a short period of time before? Absolutely. Kevin, were you trying to say something there? I think it was actually background noise, but I will come in because I agree with that. So <laughs> I, think the, I, think, I think there is the risk that we just focus on one element and recognize that if we did that, and we've been doing that for a while, we're obviously not going to succeed. So I completely agree that this requires a combination of actions. I do think if one wants to be optimistic, and it is important, I think, in the midst of all the uh, challenges that we face, I think the level of action now and the intensity with which this is being discussed, and that's a soft metric, is definitely and unequivocally far greater than I've seen in many years. And there is this moment when I think the case for action has become urgent. The appreciation, as I said earlier, of a more holistic view of what's going on, coupled with some very compelling numbers that have been around for a long time, it almost feels as if we just need another shove to really ensure that we can actually make some progress. And I hope that conversations like this actually have a very tangible outcome, which is a renewed appreciation for the urgency with which the action is required, because this does have to break with the past. Well, talking about a nudge, would tax incentives, this, this is a question coming from a viewer, would tax incentives created to diversify institutions and in all management levels be effective to close this generation commitment gap? Ben, do you want me to say that or is that, I don't know. Yeah, who sure, Kevin. Sure. Yeah, look, I think, um, I think this does require intervention. I don't think it's just naturally occurring. So the intervention can be in the form of incentives. And I think if that means tax, just as we, we're not discussing the environment today, but we know that environmental change when it's captured with economic incentives and opportunities to bridge the gap between the future value and the current reality of P&Ls that are very stretched will help. So I do think there are opportunities here. I'm not going to get into tax policy per se, but I think there are real opportunities to motivate action. And that could be in the form of incentives that are economic. It could just be in the form of more transparency around progress. And I think that's one of the points I heard Ashley make, which I think is a different point from privacy issues. It's just saying a lot of corporations that are publishing numbers, they just didn't publish in the past. And that will be helpful because I think it means people are far more accountable. And I think that accountability is actually the most likely way in which we're going to get progress. Briefly, another question from Zilla for you. Um, 
what is the likelihood of decisions by governments, institutions and businesses that could lead to systemic change on embedding equ equity and inclusion? Um, I think you do need uh, carrots and sticks, uh, so to say, incentivize uh, change and uh, have certain specified goals and milestones that need uh, to, to, to be reached. Uh, and at the same time, uh, have uh, 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 some sticks uh, to make sure that uh, if people do not com comply, uh, there the is consequences. Having said that, in my country, South Africa, there was a time when we were trying to incentivize change exactly with carrots and sticks. Some companies would rather pay a fine rather than make the change. Uh, so, you know, you have still to couple it with uh, the moral case, ensuring that you work towards deploying people in those spaces who believe in the change that needs to happen, the power and the role of, women, of, of trade unions, which I feel has underperformed when it comes into bringing about changes that uh, highlight and enable gender equality, uh, maybe not so bad on racial equality. Uh, so there is a bigger role for trade unions, especially now after the pandemic, when the situation uh, can be so dire if we don't act together in a positive way. Laura, one more question for you, because you were talking about remittances before and uh, along with that dependency on remittances and work being cut off um, for low middle economies, how are we going to tackle the domestic violence and growing number of suicide rates during this current scenario? Well, that's a very, a very difficult question, to be honest. Uh, remittances, I think at the moment that uh, um, there is the opening of, uh, of job, mar job markets again, remittances can come up again. Uh, it will require a little bit of time, but, uh, but will, will come up again. Uh, but uh, domestic violence is, is something that we have seen increasing substantially uh, and uh, that will have to be, uh, I think a lot of governments are trying to address it. Uh, Kevin talked a little bit about mental health and the comprehensive uh, approach that we need to look at now. And that, that is essential because uh, Poncile will, will also tell you about the amount of women that have been, uh, you know, aggravated uh, during this crisis. So uh, this is a, a, a fundamental element. But I want to come back a little bit to, to the point of how we make this change reality, because I think it is important uh, that we all recognize that social and political pressure has forced all of us, uh, and I'm talking private sector, but also public sector, to become much more uh, transparent and much more uh, open to diversity and have forced all of us to look at ways to facilitate uh, uh, that diversity in, within our own organizations and, and that responsibility. So I think uh, it, is, it is something that is happening. It is certainly not happening at the speed that we want uh, and with the results maybe that we want, but there, uh, today we all are reporting about things that uh, when I entered, for example, the UN system long time ago, nobody was thinking about, not even taking into account. And today, these are priorities for all of us, for all, the, all of the heads of agencies. And the same thing applies for the private sector. We work with the private sector in a lot with a lot of companies about how to protect migrants, how to uh, keep supply chain uh, systems clean of uh, modern slavery. So these realities are taking place and we cannot ignore those neither. Uh, I think uh, despite the fact that we are in a difficult year, there, are, there is a lot of progress that is happening. Uh, and certainly we will need to continue pushing ourselves to make it happen quicker. It was uh, fantastic to uh, hear your take and everyone's take there on uh, the various aspects involved here uh, as far as equity, inclusion and social justice goes, especially during this pandemic, post pandemic, and well, depending upon how long this pandemic really goes on for. Uh, from Zilla, for your take there on, on women and getting uh, so many of those women back into work 
uh, the policies that governments need to adopt and uh, the flexibility that they need to adopt, uh, according to Kevin, as far as geo-mobilizing goes and also looking at the full issue here and the, the intersection of minorities, age, gender and race, which Ashley also uh, looked at and, and spoke about. Also the, the moral case and the business case, uh, I, I think it, it's so important that shareholders around the world have started to realize that there's a business case involved, uh, which they can profit from as far as inclusion goes, but there's also that moral case that isn't being taken up around the world by everyone. Fantastic insights from all of you. Thanks for the viewers from around the world for your input as well and your questions. I really appreciate that. And it's been fantastic having you all here, Kevin, Ashley, Fumzila, and Laura to debate equity, inclusion, and social justice.